And then at the end of the defense, we'll ask everyone to uh, mute themselves and turn on their videos and give Laura a big applause. And then we'll ask everyone to please leave, except for her thesis committee, as we'll, we'll stay on and ask Laura a few additional questions. So I'll do a little short introduction before we get going. Tell you a little bit about Laura. So there's some evidence. She's definitely been enthralled by the ocean since she was a little kid. Even though she spent many of her formative years growing up in Oklahoma, landlocked, <laughs> she still found ways to explore the ocean and play with kelp and dig in the sand and really interact and, and love being around all sorts of living creatures. So it's definitely sort of destined to go on this path of a marine scientist. Alora is also a multi-talented <laughs> Renaissance woman. You can see here that she can dress the part, but she has many other talents as well. She can sing, she can dance, she can model. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> she can serenade you with smooth jazz. For even from a young age and all around performer, belly dancing here, I don't know what was going on, but definitely the total threat. Even today, she is the fashion influencer. She's also been a purveyor of very stylish headwear, right? Of course, safety first, as you can see from many of these photos. And she can even rock a pretty mean beard. Makes me pretty jealous. Right, Alori did her undergrad. She came back to the West Coast. She got to study at Pepperdine University in Malibu, probably the most beautiful college campus on the planet. And while she was there, she worked in a number of different research labs, but one that really caught my attention was that she got to work with Dr. Karen Martin, who's probably the world's expert on grunion, these fish here, that come up onto the beaches to reproduce and lay their eggs at high tides in the sand. And as an undergrad, Alora was doing some work studying the effects of varying temperatures on the development of their embryos, either when they are exposed to air or developing in the water. And at that time, my lab was starting some work looking at the effects of ocean acidification, hypoxia, and other climate change stressors on the reproduction and embryo development in rockfish. And so I thought these interests maybe would align really well. And so Laura and I met when we were at the Western Society of Naturalists meeting in Pasadena, and I chatted with her and found about her interest and thought she would be a good fit for the lab. But I didn't get the sense that she was all that impressed with me. And I think that was because maybe what she really wanted to do was work with marine mammals. Lots of evidence here. She was likes to kiss sea lions and baby beluga and take selfies with sea lions. But there's some evidence I think she kind of likes fish too. Although maybe she was worried about this one being too slimy and didn't want to touch it with her hands. <laughs> <laughs> but she got over that. So for her thesis work, which Laura will tell you about today, uh, along with her compatriot Hannah there who started in the lab together, right? they both came up to me in their first year and said they were really interested in studying the effects of environmental stressors on actual stress in the fish and the stress response and the cortisol response of those fishes. And I said, well, that sounds like a really interesting idea. I've never done anything with hormones, but let's figure it out. And the two of you, yes, you can ask this question, but you have to do something, you know, unique and kind of different from each other, work on different species, somehow tweak it in some way. So you're doing your own thing, but you know, it'd be fun definitely to have a partner to, to kind of go on this journey with. And so here was an example of the fun part of the thesis, right? They got to go diving in Catalina. Uh, Laura was studying the effects of ocean acidification and hypoxia on stress responses and reproduction in black eye gobies. So there she is swimming around with these little hand nets, catching the gobies, putting them in those buckets, and then bring them back to the lab where we had a seawater system where she could regulate the pH and the oxygen levels they were experienced. So that led to the challenging times of the thesis where <laughs> Laura had to spend a lot of time in this trailer here dealing with our temperamental seawater system. Not only that, there were other challenges she had to experience and she really overcame them. And she really, I give my hats off to her because she really worked very independently uh, on her thesis work. The first summer when I was supposed to help her, I was out for a lot of the summer with this mysterious illness. The second summer was the summer of COVID and we weren't allowed to be around each other. And so she really had to do a lot of this on her own. And so I give her a lot of credit. But I think, you know, sometimes the reactions were this, oh my God, what's happening here? With my thesis, oh my God, why is this not working, right? And ultimately I gave up 
but she didn't. She persevered, and as you'll hear today, she she put together a really nice uh, master's thesis. All right, a few additional highlights. So Alora was a recipient of the Moss Landing Wave Award in 2021. She helped us a lot by serving as a teaching assistant for the statistics class, the sampling and experimental design class. She got to use a lot of those skills doing statistics for her thesis. She worked for me a number of summers as a research assistant on our surf zone MPA monitoring project using these baited cameras and beach scenes to sample fish where the waves are breaking. And she also for three years served as kind of the lead at the IT help desk, dealing with everyone's computer problems and making sure these sorts of seminars ran smoothly. And she was a really amazing asset at the lab. I think a lot of times, probably like the figure on the left, she sort of felt like she was in this time warp, just dealing with everyone's computer issues, getting sucked into this black hole that never ended. And on the right, I think you would go ask her like, can you help me? And she's always like, what's gonna happen now? But she was really, really helpful. All right, just a couple more. I asked for pictures of Alora. And about 90% of them were pictures of her with cats. And so you can obviously see here that she has a lot of fun spending time with her furry friends, giving them lots of love. And in this case, I say most of the time, because occasionally I think <laughs> we weren't listening to her. <laughs> and, but you know, for the most part, they were great. Oh, that's a good one. And with that, um, you know, Laura met one of her best friends here at Moss Landing, Hannah there, they were pretty much inseparable. Um, I know for me as well, some of my best friends came from the experiences that we had together in graduate school. Uh, they're both now, they're on separate coasts, but I'm sure still very close. They're both helping them to manage aquarium systems. And what Alora is doing now for the past couple of months, she's been working at UC San Diego as a research associate managing a vivarium here of zebrafish, like you can see up there up top, uh, which are a model species used for biomedical research in the lab of Dr. Deborah Yellen. It sounds like things are going well. And so, Alora, I wish you the best of, of luck as you continue along in this career. And we're gonna turn it over to you and look forward to listening to your thesis. All right. You uh, thank start. you for the always amazing introduction, Scott. Um, you always manage to get the best pictures and then also spin them in the best ways. Okay. Well, your, your parents and friends were, uh, you know, so <laughs> Yes, <laughs> they, had, they had quite the, quite the um, arsenal to share with you. Okay, let me share my screen. Make sure. All right, can everyone see that fine? I'm gonna assume yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. So first I wanna thank everyone for coming today to my thesis defense. Um, it's titled The Impacts of Climate Change on black Eye Gobi Stress Responses, Reproduction and Offspring Fitness. So first I will start out by giving you a brief introduction um, to orient you to um, this study. So first we'll talk about climate change. Um, climate change has been defined as long-term shifts in both temperature and weather patterns at local, regional, and global scales. So historically these changes happen naturally, um, but human activities, particularly combustion of natural gases and deforestation have exacerbated these resulting effects of climate change. So since the beginning of the industrial revolution in the 1800s, we've seen increased frequency of events such as hurricanes, heat waves, wildfires, droughts, floods, and aquatic hypoxia, as well as changes to cloud cover, vegetation cover, sea level, the amount of ice at the Earth's poles, glacial melt, and ocean pH. And as the climate continues to change at this increased rate, all animals are having to respond and adapt if they're able to. So um, some animals are not able to adapt and will suffer as a result as these increases or as these processes are happening at the increased rate. So it's important to evaluate how a wide variety of these animals will fare under the current and projected ocean conditions in order to make inferences about their future. Um, so for my project specifically, I was interested in two of the resulting aspects of climate change. The first being ocean acidification. So as we continue to burn fossil fuels to make energy, we are adding uh, carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere. And since the widespread use of fossil fuels, the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere has increased by 100 parts per million and only continues to increase. So actually a majority of the CO2 that we input into the atmosphere will be absorbed into the ocean. 
So as CO2 is dissolved here in seawater, it will react with the water and to form carbonic acid. And then um, those, the carbonic acid will dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions or hydrogen and carbonate ions. So now as these hydrogen ions are increasing in concentration in the seawater, this is what causes the pH to drop and ocean acidification to occur. Now, historically, the surface waters of the ocean have had a pH of 8.2, um, but this has since dropped to 8.1. And although this might not seem like a lot, um, pH is actually measured on a logarithmic scale. So a 0.1 drop in pH actually translates to a 30% increase in the acidity of the water. And as climate change continues to progress, current models have predicted that pH could drop by 0.4 pH units for an average of 7.7 .7 across um, the surface of the ocean by the year 2100. So now that you are oriented to ocean acidification, now I'll talk about the other stressor that I focused on in my study, which is hypoxia. And hypoxia events do occur naturally in the ocean. However, they are becoming more frequent and more intense in the years following increased development in agriculture. They're especially common in coastal areas um, due to a process called eutrophication. This is depicted here. And eutrophication happens as a result of an influx of large amounts of nutrients into coastal waters. Think things like runoff from agriculture and people fertilizing their lawns. Um, the nutrients that are introduced, they cause phytoplankton to bloom. <clears throat> and however, when these um, phytoplankton die off, they will precipitate on the sea floor. And as they decompose, they create a hypoxic environment as well as forming toxic substances, which will cause fish and other organisms around them to suffocate and die. So like I said, these events have increased in intensity and frequency in the near shore environment. And along with these temporary hypoxic events, ocean warming has caused increased stratification in the ocean, meaning that <clears throat> the oxygen minimum zone has been uh, slowly shoaling towards the surface. So today animals that weren't experiencing these hypoxic levels before are now. So typically uh, the dissolved oxygen content of seawater is between six and nine milligrams of dissolved oxygen per liter of seawater. But during hypoxic events, it has been recorded to get down to as low as two milligrams per liter. So clearly ocean acidification and hypoxia um, have serious implications to consider when you're thinking about climate change, um, but regional phenomena can actually increase and contribute to these climate change effects. So coastal upwelling is a common um, occurring physical process here within the California current system. As surface winds blow along shore, this forces surface water to be deflected offshore. And as it moves offshore, this forces deeper water to rise up to replenish um, the moving surface waters. Upwelling events have been recorded to last as long as two weeks where that deep water is constantly moving up towards the surface. So what makes upwelling a topic of concern for my research specifically, as well as others who are interested in ocean acidification and hypoxia, are the characteristics of this upwelled water. So the deep water will be cooler, rich in nutrients, have less dissolved oxygen than surface waters, as well as a lower pH. So at this point, it might be clear to see where I'm going with this, but this upwelled water can have pHs as low as 7.4 and dissolved co oxygen content as low as two milligrams per liter. And then don't forget about what we talked about earlier with nutrients and eutrophication. So as this water is being brought up, um, there's possibility of this low pH and low dissolved oxygen events to happen. And so off the coast or off the west coast of the US and Mexico, there are periods throughout the spring and summer when the conditions in our nearshore environments are already reflecting what climate change models are predicting for the year uh, 2100. So now that we've defined both ocean acidification and hypoxia and put them into the context of our local environment, um, let's talk about how the specific ways in which they affect fish. So both ocean acidification and hypoxia have been clearly documented to have negative effects on marine life. First, um, previous literature has shown that ocean acidification has been observed to alter a resp respiratory gas exchange, weaken immune function, cause severe tissue damage in larvae, shift breeding seasons, and affect reproductive output. 
And in addition, hypoxia is shown to decrease aerobic scope, increase the cost of osmoregulation, force energy trade-offs, increase embryonic mortality, and cause de developmental deformations. Now, this uh, summary just scratches the surface for how fish react to these aspects of climate change, because once you really start looking into it, you will find that it can be difficult to draw patterns in the reactions of fish because of species-specific responses. Two species may react in completely opposite ways when faced with these different types of stressors. So it's important to evaluate how a wide variety of species will um, adapt when they are facing these stressors. So when they are experiencing stress, both ocean acidification and hypoxia um, will induce a stress response. And that is what's pictured here for fish. Um, the stress response is an effort to alter processes in the body to be able to maintain homeostasis while under stress. So when a fish first encounters a stressor, they'll receive the initial signal to their brain. And then this message is passed on through various routes to the head kidneys which will then produce both catecholamines and cortisol. So cortisol is often referred to as the stress hormone and it's actually the same hormone that you will produce if you're under stress. And it's a great proxy um, that my study used to determine how stressed out fish are when they're experiencing both ocean acidification and hypoxia. Now, if you're looking at this depiction, we can see that cortisol affects fish in a lot of ways namely reducing immune function, reducing reproduction, and reducing growth. So as I mentioned, cortisol was used to determine how stressed the fish in this study were. And we can do that because of what is already known about the production of cortisol under stress. So first we'll talk about the stress response in an acute, um, for acute stress. This is when a stressor is only present for a short amount of time. Um, whether it just be a momentary stimuli or something that lasts an hour to a couple of days. But this is when an organism experiences acute stress. This graph depicts um, a very typical curve for what will happen to the cortisol over time. Within one hour of exposure to the acute stress, their cortisol will spike and hit its peak. And then over the course of about a week, it will fall um, and return back to normal levels. Now that we've talked about acute stress, we'll talk about what happens when a fish is under chronic stress. So the response looks very similar to that of acute stress initially. In fact, you can even think about um, it as any time that an organism is going to be under chronic stress, they will inevitably experience the intensity of an acute, uh, an acute stress response first. Um, but additionally, their cortisol levels may remain above their baseline while the stressor stimuli is still present despite whether or not some adaptation occurs. So as you can see here, it will peak rapidly and fall, but then stay above what it was um, when no stressor was present. So um, sustained levels of increased cortisol mean that those processes described earlier, such as immune function and reproduction will, be continue, uh, will continue to be decreased while the stressor is still present. <clears throat> Now, these explanations have uh, been in the context of how adult fish respond to stress, but it's important to note that these stressors will affect fish differently at different life stages. Um, early life stages are often more susceptible to the adverse effects of stressor stimuli. However, um, embryonic fish will actually rely entirely on maternally derived hormones, as they generally do not have a fully developed endocrine system until about two weeks post hatching. So if there is a relationship between the amount of cortisol being produced by the mother and the amount found in the yolk of the eggs, the stress that the mother is experiencing during reproduction is very important for the health and fitness of her offspring. Now, what's interesting is it isn't totally clear whether or not increased cortisol is ultimately good or bad for offspring. Elevated cortisol has shown um, some detrimental effects such as decrease in incubation time, decrease in hatching success and growth, but there have been studies that have shown that having an increased cortisol may better equip um, offspring to handle the stressors that they are presented with um, after they hatch, particularly the same ones that were experienced by their mothers. <clears throat> 
So now that we've covered how the organisms respond to different stressors, what happens when stressors are presented at the same time? So animals are going to rarely experience um, just one stressful thing at a time. And ocean acidification and hypoxia often co-occur. So this is partly because of the instances we discussed, um, such as being both uh, common in nearshore environments and both being a characteristic of the deep water being brought up by upwelling. And uh, the effect that multiple stressors can have on an organism can be described in three different ways. So the first is called an additive effect. And this is simply when the stressors exhibit no interaction and are simply a sum of the individual responses. So let's pretend the average cortisol concentrations for a fish under ocean acidification or a OA stress was around here. And the average cortisol concentrations for fish experiencing hypoxia stress was around here. So for an additive effect, we would assume that the resulting stress when presented with both um, stressors at the same time would look something like this. You can see that it's roughly um, just adding both of these stressors together to get a stronger um, effect. So the additive is when there is no interaction between the stressors. But if there is an interaction, one way they can um, work together or against each other is through antagonistically, meaning that the resulting effect is going to be equal to less than the sum of the individual responses. So something like this, it could be more than that, both of them or less than them, but when you add them together, it's going to be less than what you expected it to be if it was simply an additive effect. Now, the final way that stressors can interact is by having a synergistic effect. Uh, this results in a response that is larger than the sum of the individual responses. So it would look something like this. Um, in this scenario, the stress of one phenomenon could amplify the other as it co-occurs. So how ocean acidification and hypoxia behave as multiple stressors will be important for this study as the amount of cortisol present directly reflects how stressed the animal is. And when considering how negative effects of cortisol are also influenced by how much is present. So also we've made our way through climate change, stressors and stress. So now I will introduce you to the fish um, that I use to understand these concepts a little bit better. So here is the black eye goby, Rhinogobiox nicolsii. This is my study species. Um, they are relatively small fish and they're commonly found at the rock sand interface of rocky reefs. They are abundant off the west coast of the US and Mexico and are found from the rocky intertidal all the way down to 60 meters. They are protogenous hermaphrodites, which means that they will all start their lives as females and after reaching a certain size, or in the absence of any males, they will undergo a sex change and become male. Now their breeding season happens over um, the spring and summer, starting usually in April and going through the beginning of October. And for their breeding season, they will usually make their nests in small crevices or on the underside of rocks with the males guarding the nests until they hatch. Now they were great to use for my project because they are extremely abundant um, right off the coast of Monterey. And they um, also inhabit this coastal area, which is of particular concern for my project in the scope of ocean acidification and hypoxia. And on top of that, they are pretty easy to catch and adapt well to aquarium life. And they were able to reproduce successfully in captivity, which was very important to this study. Um, so now that I have introduced you um, to all of this background information, let's talk about what I aimed to accomplish um, to build on this information that we already know through this study. So overall, I had four research objectives that I wanted to accomplish. The first was to compare the acute and chronic stress response of adult black-eyed gobies to both individual and multiple climate change stressors. The second was to categorize the effect of ocean acidification and hypoxia on the stress response of black-eyed gobies as either additive, synergistic, or antagonistic. Then I wanted to determine the relationship between maternal cortisol production and the initial egg cortisol concentration that was found after laying. And finally, I wanted to evaluate the effects of the increased cortisol on the larval's physiological fitness of the fish's offspring. So now keeping these objectives in mind, we'll briefly go over what I hypothesize on the coming slides. So first from objective one, 
I hypothesize that black eyed gobies would have higher cortisol concentrations at one hour than at one week. And also that the pH stressor would have the smallest increase in cortisol followed by low dissolved oxygen with a multiple or combined stressor treatment eliciting the strongest stress response. Next, I hypothesized that ocean acidification and hypoxia would have an additive effect on the black eye goby stress response. And I predicted that there would be a positive relationship between maternal and offspring cortisol concentrations. And finally, for the fourth objective, I predicted that offspring will have an increased initial cortisol concentrations, will exhibit decreased time to hatching, they'll be smaller, they will weigh less and have a higher standard metabolic rate than those with a lower initial cortisol concentration. So now let's move on to the method section, which I will, where I will describe how I tested these hypotheses. So first, fish collections took place at the very beautiful and often picturesque Stillwater Cove in Carmel Bay during the summers of 2020 and 2021. Uh, as mentioned before, these gobies, they like to hang out near the rock sand interface of rocky reefs. So all the gobies were collected using hand nets on scuba. And as you can tell from this video, um, they are very abundant um, in Stillwater Cove, as I think there were at least 10 that made an appearance in this very short clip. Um, the gobies were placed into these collection buckets and they were brought to the surface um, where they were transferred to large coolers with air stones and then transported back to the Moss Landing Marine Laboratory's aquaculture facility. And all these collections were done under the Hamilton Ichthyology Lab collecting permit and the gobies care and experimental procedures were detailed under an approved SJSU IACUC protocol. So now once we get back to the lab, there were one of four treatments that were awaiting these gobies. First, the control treatment, which mimics ambient ocean conditions at nine milligrams of dissolved oxygen per liter of seawater and a pH of 8.1. Then there's the low DO treatment, um, which the DO was lowered to two milligrams per liter and the pH remained at 8.1. There was the low pH treatment, where the, DA, where the DO stayed around nine milligrams per liter and the pH was lowered to 7.3. And then the combined with both um, pH and DO being lowered, the DO to two milligrams per liter and the pH to 7.3. Now both these treatment parameters were maintained in similar ways. So to lower the DO or the dissolved oxygen content, nitrogen gas was bubbled into header tanks that fed into the treatment tanks. Um, this bubbling was monitored by a Lolligo system software that was set to maintain the DO of the seawater within 0.5 milligrams per liter of units of the set point. And similarly, um, for pH, carbon dioxide was bubbled into header tanks and was also monitored by, by a Lolligo system software that maintained the pH within 0.05 units of the target set point. So, for the portion of the study that examined only the adult uh, goby stress responses, two replicate tanks were set up for each treatment and 30 adult black eyed gobies were added to each tank. To assess the acute stress response, um, one hour after the gobies were added to the tanks, 15 were euthanized and frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius until they were processed um, for cortisol analysis. And to examine the chronic stress response, the remaining 15 gobies were euthanized at one hour or sorry, at one week after being placed under the treatments. And these fish were also frozen until ready for cortisol analysis. So when the time came to prep the gobies, um, 700 milligrams of muscle tissue was dissected from the tail of each fish. It was then homogenized in seven mils of phosphate buffered saline using this um, Downs glass homogenizer. They were then allowed to um, go through a couple of freeze thaw cycles to make sure all the cells were broken up. And then the samples were then centrifuged and the supernatant was pipetted off immediately to be used in um, an ELISA kit. So these are great um, for looking at things like cortisol. Um, they come with everything you need in the kit. So um, you'll place the samples uh, into each well of these 96 well plates and the um, cortisol that's in the sample will bind to the cell walls. And then you add reagents in succession that cause the solution in the wells to change color based and the intensity of the color will be based on how much cortisol is present. So then you can use a microplate reader 
um, to measure the absorbance of each well and use a standard curve in order to determine the amount of cortisol within each of your samples. And for this study, all um, standards and samples were run in uh, duplicates. So for this first portion, the statistical analysis um, first, Linear regressions were run to rule out whether or not size of the individual had an effect on the amount of cortisol it produced. Um, this was to determine if size needed to be controlled for when comparing the responses among time points and treatments. Um, and then following that analysis, a two-way ANOVA was run with factors of time, treatment, and their interaction to examine any differences in the stress response. So now moving on to the reproduction-focused aspect of my study. Once again, um, two replicate tanks were maintained for treatment. And this time 10 gobies were placed into each. There were two males and eight females. And this was to replicate the natural black eyed goby breeding ratios um, because males will maintain a small harem of females. Then I modified some terracotta saucers by cutting off about a fourth of the plate to allow um, for an opening. And then two were placed into each tank upside down to serve as an artificial nest for the gobies to breed. Um, these tanks uh, were maintained in this manner until at least two clutches were laid per tank. And then after these two clutches um, of eggs had been collected, all the adults in the tank were euthanized and frozen until processed for cortisol analysis. So first in this video, um, it may be a little hard to tell, uh, due to the contrast in the color, but if you watch closely, you may be able to see that this is a male goby, and he's actually sort of rising up and wiggling in the water column. And this is his mating behavior. He's trying to signal to the females in the tank that he's got this really great nest um, that they could come and lay their eggs in, which you see here. This is a, um, what typically a clutch of goby eggs on the bottom of one of these saucers would look like. Um, so when the clutches were laid in this manner, a small portion of the eggs were scraped off using a razor blade, and then the eggs were frozen at negative uh, 20 degrees Celsius and were processed for cortisol analysis in the same way as the adult muscle tissue. So once all these samples were um, collected to compare the maternal and offspring cortisol concentration, linear regressions were done. There were um, two completed for this portion of the study. The first looked at the average um, adult female cortisol concentration versus the average egg cortisol concentration for each um, treatment in each tank, but um, the other one just chose the largest adult female cortisol concentration from the tank to compare against the average of the eggs. And for these regressions, due to the small sample size, significance was accepted at P less than 0.1. Now, moving on to the final aspect of this study, um, scraping some of the eggs off for cortisol analysis was not uh, where things ended for these clutches. Once laid, um, the clutches were split roughly in half and they were placed into smaller tanks that maintained either the control treatment or the treatment under which they were laid. So they were then monitored every day for hatching. And when the clutches hatched, the time of hatch was recorded, uh, the length and the weight and the standard metabolic, metabolic rate were measured for a sample of each larvae from the combination of the treatment that they were laid under and incubated under. Now, this was the plan. Um, however, I'm going to give you a small spoiler regarding my results section in that uh, there was no successful fertilization under either the low pH or the combined stressor treatments. There were clutches laid, but none of them were found to be fertilized. So going forward, this is more of what the methods for this section will look like. And we'll only be discussing eggs that were laid under either control or the low DO treatment and incubated in either the control or the low DO treatment. Um, so like I mentioned before, uh, the standard metabolic rate of the larvae was measured by the pre-send system depicted here. Uh, five larvae were placed into 200 microliter uh, volume wells uh, with 10 wells per treatment. And the wells were then sealed with parafilm and placed into a water bath that was running through chillers in order to main a or maintain a constant temperature within the wells throughout the sampling period. And the oxygen content of the wells was then measured every 15 minutes over a 24 hour period, which that's the little flashes of blue light that you're seeing in this looping video. And then um, 
After getting all the raw data, the R package fish resp was used to convert these raw oxygen saturation values into a standard metabolic rate. And then after the completion of the 24 hour sampling period for standard metabolic rate, the standard length and the wet weight was taken for uh, the larvae. Now for a statistical, statistical analysis for this portion, um, first random effects models were used to compare the larvae responses uh, response variables across treatments. Um, because the clutches were split and the same clutch was in multiple treatments, these models allowed me to add clutch ID as a random factor in order to rule out any influences that clutch itself had on these response variables. And then in order to focus more clearly on just the influence of cortisol on these responses, linear regressions were run between the cortisol concentration of each clutch uh, to the average of the four response variables. And like before, due to the small sample size, the significance for these was also accepted at p less than 0.1. All right, now we've made it through the how, so we'll move on now to some results and discussion. So first I'll remind you of these three hypotheses that I aim to answer with the adult stress response trials. Um, first, that there will be a higher cortisol at one hour than at one week, and that low pH will have the weakest stress response followed by low DO, and then the combined stressors with the strongest. And then also that ocean acidification and hypoxia will have an additive effect on black eye goby stress responses. So like I mentioned earlier, the first thing I did with the cortisol data was run two linear regressions comparing the wet weight and the standard length of the adults to their cortisol concentrations. And as you can see, there is no relationship whatsoever, um, which allowed me to rule this out as a factor um, to consider when comparing their cortisol concentrations. So I went forward with this two-way ANOVA that compared treatments, time points, and as well as their interaction. Now, it should be noted the only significant uh, comparison from this was the interaction between time point and treatment. And if you look at the graph, uh, you will notice for all of the treatments other than this control, um, they had a higher cortisol concentration at one week or at one hour than at one week. Um, so the control was the complete opposite in a pretty extreme way, in fact. And so this is likely what is driving the significant interaction that was found in the uh, interaction between the two. Um, so these extremely high cortisol values of the um, control fish at one week does not align with what was hypothesized. And it's also not what you would expect when you're thinking about um, prior studies. So this is likely um, a result of a stress stimuli that happened or took place outside of the parameters of the study. Many things can occur that um, would stress out a fish and it is likely that something um, extraneous or confounding happened that initiated an acute stress response within just one or two hours before euthanasia at one week. Um, in fact, to kind of explore this more, uh, I put together the data from the adults of the reproduction trials. And so this would be fish that are considered to be under chronic stress. And these values align more closely with what we would have expected to see with the control quite low um, and lower than the others. And this comparison was not found to be significant, um, but the appropriate trend is clearly visible um, here as well. So going back to these results, uh, but taking the control response with a grain of salt, um, let's look at the responses to the other treatments. So overall, neither treatment nor time point had a significant effect on the cortisol concentration produced by the adults. However, there is a clear trend that you can see that cortisol is lower at one week than at one hour. And I hypothesized that pH would have the weakest stress response when in actuality it generated the strongest, um, followed by the combined treatment and then the low DO bringing out the weakest response. So additionally, um, ocean acidification and hypoxia's effect on stress response of black eye gobies is not purely additive. 
Um, if the combined treatment was simply the sum of the individual responses, the results of this experiment would look more like this. So if you remember back to the introduction, because the actual responses we see are much lower than what we would expect for these two stressors with no interaction, we can conclude that they must be antagonistic in some way. So now, other than the anomaly observed in the control, all of the treatment groups showed a stronger response during acute stress. This would suggest that the timing of the onset of stressful conditions is key in determining how detrimental its effects will be, especially when considering the emphasis on reproduction of the study. Because all chronic stressors are first experienced as an acute stimuli, the severity of the stress response greatly relies on its timing with other factors that affect the stress response. For example, if an upwelling event began when a female began the yolk forming stage of egg formation here off the coast of California, the amount of cortisol transferred might be relatively high. So next, um, I observed the strongest stress response from the low pH and the weakest from the low DO treatment. Black eye gobies appear to have a relatively high hypoxia tolerance resulting in a weak stress response, but struggle when they are exposed to acidic seawater. If climate change is allowed to progress, although they are well equipped to survive hypoxic episodes, ocean acidification will be a chronic stress that they must adapt to in order to thrive. And I have alluded to the impressiveness of Gobi's ability to survive and reprodu reproduce at DO levels as low as two milligrams per liter. And this is due to a review that was published in 2015 that reported gobies as having their threshold as low as 3.3, um, which he retrieved from an ocean database in the same year that this was published. So this might suggest that gobies have already expanded their minimum oxygen threshold with, within the past few decades. And in the end, it was clear to see that ocean acidification and hypoxia work antagonistically on the black eye goby stress response. When other studies tested the same stressors together, um, there were many disruptions to biological processes such as acidosis compensation, um, cellular defense mechanisms, and immune function. And the results of this study may suggest that there is also a disruption behind the mechanisms of the stress response. So now circling back to my hypotheses, to sum up the results of the adult stress response analysis, we found that yes, there were trends that showed cortisol was typically higher during acute stress than during chronic stress at one week. However, I must reject my second hypothesis because low pH in fact had the strongest stress response and consequently the largest increase in muscular cortisol concentration um, with low DO having the weakest response. And finally, when considering how ocean acidification and hypoxia work together, um, I rejected this hypothesis as well because the result of this study pointed towards an antagonistic effect. So moving on to the next portion of this study that aimed to characterize the relationship between maternal and offspring cortisol concentrations, keeping in mind um, my hypothesis was that there will be a positive association. So here are the uh, resulting graphs from the regressions that were run between the female and egg cortisol content. Now on the left here, this is only um, the largest female's cortisol concentration being compared to the average of all of the uh, cortisol of the eggs from each clutch. So on the right, this will be the average of the females uh, compared to the average of the eggs. And I'll remind you that both of these regressions were conducted because for this experiment, there was no way for me to tell which female had bred. Um, however, it is actually most likely that the largest female in the tank would have been the one selected for breeding. But regardless of which uh, graph you look at or which female data was used, there are some important similarities that you can see between each graph. Um, both show a clear positive trend. Um, in fact, if you take just the largest females, this is a significant positive relationship between the two, which is denoted by this dark green regression line. Um, in addition, if you look at the rank order of the cortisol for the eggs, it is the same um, for each treatment between both graphs. So it is clear to see that the concentration of cortisol that is initially present in black eye goby eggs is directly influenced by how stressed the mother is at the time of reproduction. So now we know that when adult gobies are stressed, they pass that stress onto their offspring through increased cortisol allocation. 
Um, continuing the conversation before, the timing of the onset of stress is going to be really important in determining the fate of the eggs and the offspring, which an important point to consider is when animals are breeding. So for black-eyed gobies, as well as many marine species off the west coast, um, they will reproduce during the spring and summer months, and this timing will coincide with upwelling. So these fish are already likely experiencing these severe levels of pH and dissolved oxygen when they are reproducing, and the conditions are only predicted to get worse. So coming back to my hypothesis, it was accepted that there was a positive relationship between offspring and maternal cortisol concentrations. Knowing that offspring of stressed mothers will have an increased initial cortisol uh, leads to an obvious next question of what is the effect of the extra cortisol and is it ultimately a good thing or a bad thing for these young black-eyed gobies? <laughs> so this brings us to the final hypothesis of the study, which is that offspring that have relatively higher amounts of initial cortisol will have shorter incubation times, um, be smaller in both standard length and weight, and have a higher standard metabolic rate than offspring with relatively low amounts of initial cortisol. So first, let's discuss the result that I was not expecting. Um, this is a, just a very simple graph to show the fertilization success rate per clutch of each treatment. So as you can see, 100% of the clutches from both the control and the low dissolved oxygen treatments had successful fertilization, but 0% of the clutches from the low pH and the combined stressor treatments had successful fertilization. These results gave a very clear picture of the treatment effect that the 7.3 pH was having on black-eyed gobies. As we know from the adult response trials, pH was uncovered as the most stress-inducing and therefore the largest concern of each of these stressors that were tested. And that same sentiment is reflected here, um, which suggests that if the ocean continues to become more acidic, future black-eyed goby populations will suffer. So when considering what might cause this disruption to fertilization, um, black-eyed gobies have external fertilization. This means that females will first lay their eggs on the underside of a rock or in a crevice and the males will come and release sperm. So this means that the sperm are required to have contact with the environment um, for at least a short amount of time. And if the environment is too harsh or in this case too acidic, um, it can impair the ability of the sperm to successfully fertilize eggs. Other studies that have looked specifically at sperm motility under different environmental pH levels have found that some species have showed reduction of sperm motility all the way down to less than 5% whenever um, the pH of the environment is at seven. And on top of the um, environmental factors that may or may not be at play, um, high levels of cortisol in fish have been shown to both inhibit spermatogenesis as well as promote sperm apoptosis or death. Um, so all of these factors may contribute to why I did not see successful fertilization under the lower pH treatments. So now moving right along to um, the offspring data. First, we'll look at the time it took for the, each clutch to hatch under each treatment. Um, here I found that eggs that were both laid and incubated under the low dissolved oxygen treatment had significantly longer incubation times than either of the other two treatments that were incubated in the control water. So the clutches that were incubated under the low DO treatment, they averaged about five days longer than those that were incubated in control. So as the amount of oxygen available in the water decreases, the gobies likely struggled to meet the energetic demands for development, resulting in the process occurring slower than normal and causing the delay in hatching. However, it should be noted that when goby eggs are released from stressful conditions of their mothers, they are able to develop at the same rate as a control group. So moving on now to the larval morphometrics that were taken, a similar pattern emerges as that that was seen um, with the incubation time. So larvae that were laid and incubated under the low dissolved oxygen treatment, um, they were both shorter and weighed less than, um, than either of the treatments that were incubated in the control water. So this further supports the idea that low amounts of dissolved oxygen in the treatment water caused the, develop the gobies to struggle to meet the demands for development. Although they were incubated for longer times and likely using more of their energy stores of their yolk during that time, these larvae were still smaller at the time of hatch 
And their smaller size puts these larvae at a disadvantage for survival and success compared to their larger counterpart counterparts that were incubated in the control water. And now to look at the data from the standard metabolic rate. As you can tell, this one deviates from the pattern that we have been seeing of the other response variables with the embryos that were laid under the low DO treatment, but incubated under the control water, showing a significant increase in their standard metabolic rate. At first, um, I found this result to be pretty, pretty confusing, um, which I think was the product of me thinking about these results only in the context of treatment rather than considering how the initial cortisol concentrations might affect these results. So we know from previous studies that increased cortisol increases energetic demands, um, which would lead to higher standard metabolic rate, which is reflected in the DO control group. Um, but I was wondering why we weren't seeing this in the dissolved oxygen um, treatment for both what they were laid under as well as incubation. And this may be linked to the developmental deficiencies that we saw from the other response variables. Under these low oxygen conditions, black-eyed gobies are not able to derive enough oxygen from the seawater in order to support an increase in their basal metabolic rate or maintain the same developmental timeline as those that were incubated in the control water. So these results have given us a pretty good idea of the role that treatment played for what we were seeing in the larvae. But now let's take a closer look at how cortisol specifically influence these observed changes. So these are the regression analyses that were run between the egg cortisol concentrations and the four different response variables. The negative relationship found between egg cortisol and length at the time of hatch is the only relationship that was found to be significant, indicated by the dark green regression line. However, I think visualizing the data this way creates a really clear picture for the influence of cortisol on these responses, because if you look at the overall trend of the data for each variable, you'll notice that the overall trend matches the trend that you see when you just look at the clutches. So for example, if you're looking at this relationship between length and egg cortisol concentration, the overall relationship is, of course, negative. And then if you look at these specific clutches from each treatment, these are also reflected um, within them as well. So as the cortisol went up, the length went down for each clutch. Now, the only treatment that deviated from this pattern was for time to hatching, um, which was opposite for the DO control uh, treatment. So this is just a video of some larvae that had just hatched. Um, those little tiny black things wiggling around, those are baby gobies. Um, but from these results and analyses, there are sort of two ideas or takeaways. The first is the effect of treatment causing the developmental challenges. Um, but it is important to note that gobies that are released from these stressful conditions were able to develop normally. This again reinforces this overarching idea that the timing of the stressors is one of the most important implications for how reproduction will be affected by these stressors. If hypoxia persists through the incubation period of black eye gobies, they are put at a disadvantage upon hatching. And in addition to treatment, um, cortisol was also contributing to these disadvantages that were seen. Um, we found that it increased incubation time, which could cause developing embryos to rely longer on their yolk stores, as well as leave them susceptible to egg predation for longer amounts of time. Um, in addition, it decreased their size at the time of hatching, giving them an inherent disadvantage compared to embryos that developed normally and hatched at the appropriate size. And finally, it increases their energetic demand by elevating the standard metabolic rate, which puts a strain on the larval fish to meet these increased energy requirements, despite the presence of stressors and developmental disadvantages. So circling back to my predictions about how the larvae would be affected, first, we saw the opposite of what I hypothesized for time to hatching with increased cortisol actually increasing their time to hatching. <clears throat> this result is also likely um, partly influenced by the treatment effect. And now for my uh, predictions of both length and weight, they were supported with larvae being smaller as a result of increased cortisol. And lastly, the final hypothesis was also supported with increased cortisol leading to an increase in the standard metabolic rate of the larvae. So now that we've made it through all of my findings, I will briefly summarize um, them one more time and we'll talk about what this means for 
the future of gobies as well as other marine life um, in the face of climate change. So first, increased cortisol was observed for gobies under both acute and chronic stress um, when exposed to these climate change stressors. And as a reminder, the increased cortisol itself creates a strain on the gobies that leads to a, a collection of disruptions in their natural behavior seen in this figure that we talked about in the introduction. Now, as a reminder, um, or on top of this, we should be studying um, how, uh, or sorry, future studies should be conducted to describe the stress response of black-eyed gobies. Um, I think it would be great to do a curve on um, what black-eyed goby stress response looks like by taking additional, um, taking additional cortisol measurements throughout that initial hour um, that their cortisol will be increasing. Next, um, the next conclusion was that ocean acidification and hypoxia interact to elicit an antagonistic response on cortisol production in black-eyed gobies. For this, further study should be conducted in order to determine the pathways in which uh, the, the combination of these two stressors inhibits the stress response of these black-eyed gobies. Next, it was clear that both ocean acidification and hypoxia negatively affect the overall reproductive success of black-eyed gobies. So <clears throat> at a 7.3 pH, reproduction simply was not able to happen. Um, and if that continues, it would lead to a profound effects that are not excluding the extinction of black-eyed gobies under predicted future ocean conditions. And then although reproduction was able to occur under hypoxic conditions, the developing embryos in larva are placed at a disadvantage through exposure to harsh conditions as well as increased cortisol concentrations. So when thinking about this conclusion, I think to build upon these findings, it would be very valuable to characterize what pH black eye goby sperm loses its functionality in order to more or less confirm or deny whether or not this is the mechanism that prevented the um, unsuccessful clutches in the low pH treatments. And for the successfully hatched offspring from the hypoxia treatment, um, these larvae were not set up for a life of success um, as they were having to spend longer amounts of time incubating and upon hatching, um, they were both had physical as well as energetic uh, disadvantages. So I think it would be really valuable um, to go forward from here with this portion of research um, by devising experiments that would better differentiate between the effect of treatment and the effect of the increased cortisol on the success of, and fitness of the larvae. So now we'll talk about what these conclusions mean. Um, so future black-eyed goby populations are at risk under the projected future ocean conditions. Um, they clear, the results of this clearly showed this. Um, and this is even more concerning because as there are species that live in these areas with upwelling, um, it's probably they are already experiencing these low stressful levels of both pH and DO during this time right now, rather than in the year 2100. On top of this, the gobies are not living in a vacuum out there on the rocky reefs. Um, this image shows only some of the other, other animals that um, inhabit these areas with them, um, but many other species could react in the same way as the gobies. These stressors could affect the reproductive output of many other marine species and which would be um, very bad for the coastal ecosystems. And this might also disrupt fisheries due to fish populations not being able to have enough successful reproductive output to maintain sustainability. And finally, from this study, it is clear that efforts should be made both in our personal lives as well as on higher levels to slow the progress of anthropogenic climate change. Um, with emphasis on reducing ocean acidification and minimizing the occurrence of hypoxic events. Because if these stressors are to become too prevalent too quickly, it's clear that some species may not be able to adapt and persist under them. Okay, so that was ending on kind of a sad note, um, but that concludes the presentation for my defense. So now I'll move on to acknowledging, acknowledgements before um, taking some questions. So I have a lot of people to thank, but you all definitely deserve your shout outs. So I will start by uh, thanking my committee 
Um, you guys have been amazing, extremely responsive and extremely helpful. And it has meant a lot to me that you have supported me finishing up my career uh, at Moss Learning remotely. Um, Scott, it has been a pleasure to be in your lab. Um, I appreciate that you saying that I got through a lot of these things on my own, um, but I feel like every time that I came to you with any sort of uh, request or need, you always did what it uh, needed to make it happen, which I definitely appreciate. And I've learned so much from you um, about how to be a better scientist and a member of the scientific community. And these are things that I will take with me for the rest of my career. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Gita, I took a class with you almost every semester that I was taking class at uh, Moss Landing. And the one semester that I didn't, it was definitely weird. Um, so you have definitely had a big influence on um, my uh, success as a student, as well as um, your physiology classes literally what inspired this thesis. So I wanna thank you for being a uh, great role model and inspiration throughout my time at Moss Landing. And Max, thank you so much for um, teaching me about ocean acidification and eutrophication and things like that and giving me uh, an expert foundation for uh, my thesis research. Next, I wanna thank uh, the tons of people who helped me with this project. Of course, my Gobi collectors. Um, I, I could not have done it without you, definitely not. Um, on my first collecting trip, I think I caught a total of seven fish. So um, it definitely would not have happened without you all. I also, of course, wanna shout out the uh, OA and Hypoxia tent crew. As Scott mentioned, it is not for the faint of heart uh, to be doing work in there. Um, so thank you for not only helping me with my experiments, but also being there whenever catastrophes happened um, and systems went down and not even helping me with that, but just offering some comic relief sometimes whenever you feel you're at rock bottom in the, the uh, OA and hypoxia tent. I also, of course, want to thank Marine Ops, um, especially John Douglas or JD and I. Um, your support throughout my project was incredible and um, going from having no experience to diving to having to maneuver a small boat and dive for my thesis, it would not have happened without you. And um, Di, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to dive um, and creating something that I will enjoy forever. Um, okay, I want to thank the uh, admin staff, of course, for all of your support for my research and always figuring out the various issues that I came to you with and responding to them in quick ways. This definitely would not have um, happened without you all. Um, also, of course, I have to thank IT. Um, I never expected to have an IT job whenever I joined um, the lab. I definitely was not um, the most technologically savvy when I started. That picture that Scott showed of me looking panicked at the IT help desk was probably uh, my most normal state while there, but thank you so much, Theo, um, for teaching me so much, as well as Rhett and Michael, um, who were my original bosses when I started at uh, the help desk. But you guys turned me from technologically challenged to tech savvy, and those are skills that I will uh, keep with me forever. And um, I will not forget my experience at the uh, MLML IT help desk. Um, I'll shout out the Moss Landing Ichthyology Lab. I would list your names, but it would probably take about three slides to include all of you. So thank you to both the present and past members who both um, gave me good laughs and good times while at the lab, as well as uh, giving me great feedback for my project. And I also wanna thank the Yellen Lab at UCSD um, for supporting me these last few months um, as I both learn a new job and work um, to wrap up my thesis. You guys have been um, incredibly welcoming and incredibly supportive um, during these couple months where I've been sort of doing both. And then of course, I wanna give a big shout out to my friends um, that I've made here at Moss Landing. You guys have been amazing and have seriously been the reason that I have made it here today. It would not have happened um, without you guys' support and laughs and all the good stuff um, that came along with knowing you all. And then of course, I have to thank my family. Um, Sorry to my brothers, I don't have a picture of me with you guys, but know that I love you and uh, thank you for supporting me no matter how many times I tell you guys that I wanna move across the country or um, that being in Oklahoma, I wanna study marine biology. Um, it has meant the world to me, so thank you. <laughs>
And with that, I will take any questions. All right. Nice job, Alora. That was a really good presentation. So yeah, we'll give us a second here for anyone who wants to ask a question. You can raise your hand, fire away. Here, I'll ask a question. Maybe that will stimulate others. Oh, no, Max, he raises his hand. He can go first. <laughs> All right, Max. Thanks for the nice There you go. I really Thank enjoyed you. your presentation. That was really well laid out. Um, I had a quick, like, big picture question about fishes. Um, you <laughs> said uh, early in your presentation that you know all fish react slightly different, slightly different, slightly differently to different stressors. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know do did the gobies like react like most fishes or was well, they a bit different in terms of their response to DO and pH compared to other important fishes on the coast here? Yeah, so generally there, um, when comparing to other research that had been done specifically in the ichthyology lab with species like rockfish and things, they did have similar responses to those. Um, so yes, they did have the increased stress response to both of them that were seen. And um, I know that for, um, Hannah's research, she also found a stronger um, result when they were faced with pH. So that is also consistent. Um, and her species were found um, in a similar environment as the gobies. So that could also have sort of um, an influence on that. So yes, they were similar to what, um, what has been seen. All right, thanks. Yes. All right, Diana, you are next in line. Hi, Alora. Great job. Really enjoyed your talk. I missed Thanks, something and I'm going to miss you, but I oh. missed something. So I just wanted to, before uh, we move on, maybe you can tell us that about, it was about the large females and the okay. cortisol effect. And w why was it that you use the large females? Did, was there a more pronounced effect there? And oh, well, first of yes. all, why did... so I used the largest females just because um, there was no way for me to tell which fish um, was reproducing in those treatments because they were just pooled. It was 10, uh, 10 males and, or sorry, eight males and, or eight, whoa, eight females and two males. Um, so that's why uh, we did both. So Generally, the largest female in a harem will be the one that is reproducing with um, the male. So um, that's why we ran that first initial one with just the largest female. But then since we weren't sure, included all of them together to be able to see that pattern. Okay. All right. Thanks for explaining yeah. that. Okay. I think uh, Dina was next. Hello, Dina. Hi, Laura. Great job. That was really lovely. Um, uh, so I have a couple of questions. My first one is about whether you saw, and I don't think you mentioned it, but did you see any um, sex specific differences in the original uh, cortisol measurements in the adults? So that is something that I looked at initially and um, one, there was no difference found in the production between the males and the females whenever looking at the statistical analysis of that. Okay, and so I guess, yeah, so your prediction is that it is the males that are the, the root of the fertilization problem, um, but it, it, it could be the eggs as well. Like, are there ways that you could do more of a, I don't know, like an IVF type thing where you could kind of more, more identify which side or both sides that's coming from? Yeah, that would actually be really interesting to try to categorize if it's something about the eggs and the low pH that is altering their ability to be fertilized. Wow, I've never, hadn't considered doing IVF, but now that it's so common in the lab that I'm in now, that is an interesting point to bring up. Cool, okay. I have other questions, but I can ask you later. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right, let's let Deborah ask a question. Your current boss. <laughs> hey, Laura. She's got a good singer for you. <laughs> 
Hello, Debbie. <laughs> I really enjoyed this talk. It was really informative, um, and I'm really delighted by all the great work you've done here. Um, although, as you mentioned, you know, it is kind of sad at the end, right? You know, to sort of see how um, how much trouble the Gobi seem to find themselves in. And so, actually, my my question or crazy idea, you know, is kind of linked to what Dina was asking about IVF. So, you know, just purely speculatively, you know, if mm -hmm. you could come up with any fix, you know, any kind of like therapeutic or genetic change or something that could be done, right, you know, to like, in captivity, rescue right. you know, the reproductive abilities of the Gobi, like, what would it be? Oh, wow, this is a great question. Well, I mean, one easy answer <laughs> would be, I guess, um, if they're in captivity, you could easily control for the the um, the sort of parameters that they're experiencing. Um, so you could obviously rear them in control conditions, which would be a great way to keep the species alive, but wouldn't really translate to keeping their populations out in um, out and alive uh, in the oceans. Um, but yes, that actually is a great question. Um, I think it would be interesting if there was some way to first devise, like Dina was saying, what is actually the mechanism behind um, what is impairing their fertilization. And then maybe, I don't know if you could somehow alter um, the male sperm to be more resistant to pH at a lower, or if it is with something with the eggs, maybe there's um, a compositional change in the chorions that you could, um, also somehow uh, alter with through um, these different techniques. Um, yeah, that yeah that's really interesting. If there was some sort of, a, I don't know, accelerated evolution through genetic engineering or yeah. something, you know, that one could, um, yeah, I think it, it does, I think, build directly after Dean was saying, if you knew which, uh, mm -hmm. where the mechanism was on a molecular level, you know, um, could you dream right. of a way to counter it? Yeah. Right. Maybe you should start playing with zebrafish and all the new techniques you're learning in your new lab. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We'll <laughs> That'd be great. All right. I think Theo has his hand up. Oh, hi, Laura. This is Tom Connolly in the hi, Tom. Oh. room. Go ahead, Tom. Tom Connolly in the seminar room. We just had some feedback there. But um, Really nice talk. Uh, I was really interested in your uh, your reproduction results. Um, and you mentioned the fact that they reproduce at the time when upwelling and these stressors might be the most intense. I was wondering if there's any chance that they might shift the timing of their reproduction to a less stressful time, or is that pretty much fixed? Um, so so black-eyed gobies actually do have a bit of flexibility in their reproductive time. And this is depending on where they're found. So um, the Southern populations will reproduce year round. So it is um, uh, in a hypothetical situation, they could uh, possibly alter their uh, breeding season, but it is likely more um, determined by the temperature of the water. Um, at least now. So yeah, they do have the ability to reproduce at other times during the year outside of their breeding season. Um, which, so yeah, they could in theory, maybe at some point uh, shift it off of these times that are too stressful. Yeah, thank you. Great, I'll ask one question and then we'll see if there's any others. And if not, we will congratulate you. So I was just curious when you were doing your husbandry with your fish or observing them, did you notice any differences in any of the reproductive or courtship or territorial behaviors in any of the different oxygen or pH treatments that you were, uh, that you were using? Uh, okay. Um, so black eye gobies, they actually do have a physical marker for stress. Um, whenever they're experiencing stress, they will, their bodies typically are a nice white, uh, very pretty white kind of opalescent color. Um, but when they're stressed, they become very dark and mottled. Um, so one way to just peer into a tank and determine if I was thinking they were stressed or not um, was that. And as far as interactions go, um, no, I didn't necessarily notice any um, 
territoriality or aggressive um, behavior that differed between any of the tanks. There wasn't one that seemed more aggressive than the other. Um, sometimes the large males um, would, would, I mean, as a large male would just be um, more aggressive to the smallers in the tank. So to kind of help for that, um, whenever I was setting up the breeding tanks, I did try to pick two males of the same size. Um, so other than, than like the fish that were in like low DO treatments showing that they were stressed and those types of things, I did not notice any significant or at least not enough that um, it was brought to my attention that there was any differences between the tanks. Yeah, I like that idea about the color change. I think that that'd be a fun thing to do in the future, right? To try to like get photos oh, of them yeah. at different points of their stress and then correlate mm -hmm. the cortisol with their colors. Yeah, that's pretty neat. All right. And doesn't seem like there's anyone else. So at this point, let's let everyone turn on your video, unmute yourselves, give Alora a big applause and congratulations for a job well done. Woohoo! <laughs> Alora! Yay! Congratulations! Great job.